pedagogically going around the world, leading workshops, um, and uh, in terms of the development of the technology itself, since uh, Mark has created Isadora, which many of you are familiar with, some of you may have worked with, but if not, you all will have very soon. So, all right, so thank you very much, Mark and Don. Um, can I just point out a funny thing that we noticed at lunch, which is that, so Mark and I, as David just said, have been touching these digital materials for like 30 years, right? So we feel a little prehistoric, and I wore a shirt with dinosaurs <laughs> on it. <laughs> I just think that's kind of funny. So, so funny. I, I was the one who noticed it. She didn't notice. It was a subliminal thing. Um, but it, we were actually, Don and I were talking about why are we here? Because in fact, the bulk of what we have done uh, is in the past, right? We started, actually you'll see even before 1994, we're going to start in 1989, looking back at some of our work, and we're going to take a little survey of what we did and what came up along the way. But never, even though we haven't really made a major work together since 2015, what we're going to try and do is look at what happened and our process and our discoveries along the way, because I think that some of the ways in which we were looking at things still apply to us today, and they led us to a point where, you know, the thing is, we, even, the, even if we haven't made a piece together in three years, we haven't stopped thinking about it, and hopefully we can shed some light on some of the topics that we've been talking about, yeah? Well, and I just wanted to start with uh, even pre-1989, um, which is when Mark and I were students at CalArts, and we were in a composition class for choreographers and composers, and we were randomly paired to work on an exercise together, mm -hmm. literally, just you and you, Go make, and the rest came. So be careful who you get randomly paired with at a conference. They could be lifelong collaborators. Um, and I also want to mention my absolute favorite quote of all times, which has kind of governed my thinking about my art making, and that is by the awesome baseball player and quotation Yogi Berra, who said, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. <laughs> Ponder. <laughs> because, because the thing is, we come to you as practitioners. Mm -hmm. The theories, and we do have some, and we've published a handful of papers here and there. I'm sure Dawn will be publishing more now that she's at USC. Um, but, but really, it was about making artworks. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's where what our knowledge comes from, is being in the trenches, doing this work, making the work, showing it to a public, hearing the responses, as well as the things that David alluded to is teaching people. Because when we began this, you know, worldwide, I would say in 1994, there were maybe 24, two dozen people that were really into this topic, and we happened to be two of them. So, but Well, I just wanted to echo that by saying we did our research on stage in front of live audiences, which is a terrifying place to do your research, but you really find out about what, what it is and what you believe in and what it means to you in that context. So, so we'll start here. Hopefully it'll, be, it'll behave and we're okay. fine. Oh, can we I'm, do that light thing? I, it's my job. I have oh. it, I, I'm the light guy. <laughs> what? Have is it this right your brain on interactivity? Um, the light's going on. <laughs> let's try, I don't know, let's try projection mode. What's that like? I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try and sum up our entire 25 years, or nearly 30, I guess, uh, in, in a tiny mini performance, which I will do for you. and zeros change their order <laughs> with sensors on our bodies or in the space. But, you know, it's weird looking at this. You know, we're going to start talking, we're going to look back at this history. It's, it's, and I think for some of you it's easier to imagine, but I know for all of your students as pedagogues, to get an 18-year-old to imagine that there was no internet, even today in your talk, I was like, oh, YouTube was 2005. I didn't remember that. I thought it was kind of always Forever. there. Yeah. And, and so we have to sort of put ourselves in that perspective. But just the notion, 
that using a sensory device could manipulate media. We, we came into this work, in the, into this time of the beginnings of digital media, when everything was fixed, right? You had CDs or you had maybe a VHS videotape, and essentially these media were completely fixed. And suddenly it became possible around the time we were at CalArts together that you could find ways to sense movement and turn them into something else. And I guess, in, in just to add to that story of the beginning, uh, well, no, I'll tell that when we do the next thing, so go ahead. No, I just wanted to say that the kind of uh, statement that came out of that realization for us was that we were thinking about what it's like to be a dancer and choreographer and have the opportunity to work with like an orchestra, a set of live musicians with a fantastic sensor at the front, the conductor, right? And that if you had the opportunity to have liveness in the sound and visuals that were accompanying the liveness on stage, wouldn't that be wonderful? So our thing was to turn, to bring dead media, fixed dead media, to life using the chaos of this thing. But, but just the notion that you could do that, that was actually new in the times mm -hmm. that we could do it. So, so let's start, oh yeah, there's just, that's our thing, right? But that's what we're called. Some people often want to know what, what our name means. Do you want to, does anyone care? Sure. Yes. Uh, Troika. We are a mixture of dance, theater, media, three, troika, Russian for three. Also in the early 90s, we tried to call ourselves slash artists because all artists we were meeting at that time were like, I'm a choreographer, slash poet, slash guitar player, slash gamer, whatever. The slash was the unifying part of that. And you left out the ranch part was because we were on a residency with the video artist Woody Vasilka, who some of you may know his work, very famous video artist from the 70s. And and we were drinking vodka, and he just declared that everything in the Southwest should be a ranch. It should be the Vasilka Ranch, and, the, and we just took that and the Troika idea, and we put it together. So that's where it came from. But the ranch also means the collaborative way in which we make our work. Yeah. Everybody works on it together. So this is the very beginning. <laughs> yep. And so aside from my incredible haircut, uh, I've got a Mac Plus 512K. You know, and on stage is, are you there? Yeah, that's me in the middle. You're, that's this. Dawn in the middle. And so I invented this device, and I, let me tell you the pre-story. So I was deeply influenced and forever grateful to my mentor and teacher who was an electronic composer at CalArts called Morton Zabotnik. I was his assistant after school. I was his assistant for seven years. And I, I wouldn't be anything without him. And But it, it's also apocryphal what happened because I was working for him writing code for a piece he was making and he was using, he wanted to have a digital conductor so he could have his electronic music follow the live orchestra. There was a sensor at the time, brand new in 1986, called the Air Drum. It looked like a clave, it was about that big around and about that long and it sensed down, up, left, right, twist, right, and twist, left. And he used that uh, using the software that I helped him make so that the motions of the conductor would be measured, the tempo of that would be sent into a, a, a hardware sequencer, and the electronic music would accompany the live performance. So I did that with him as his assistant, but I had fallen in love with dance going to Kell Arts. I came from Nebraska. We don't have contemporary dance there. I had never <laughs> seen it before. And I saw it, and it really, honestly, it changed me somehow. It was just, to me, the most incredible thing, the way that these people could use their bodies to express themselves. And I just said, I just want to write music for that. But when Moore did this piece, I thought, we should have an air drum, but it should be on the bodies of the dancer. We should have a sensor like that, that they can be the ones that control the creation of music. So going out to the local radio shack and hacking um, radio control, control car transmitters, tearing them apart, I made these sensors. So at that point, each dancer had a, a sensor on their arm and their, and their elbow that measured the rotation of, their, of their, that limb sent the data wirelessly, because that was obviously important with the dancers, to this uh, ancient setup here, where they were able to produce music. Now, at the time, we were beyond thrilled, but all we did was go, gonk, gonk, gink. I mean, it, I mean, it really wasn't much, right? I mean, but you, the fact the most, you the, couldn't play video on a... That couldn't play video yet, so there was none of that. There was just Well, it sound. really couldn't even play samples. Really you had to have an external sampler. I right. mean, by the way, I don't want to talk too much about this kind of stuff. It's kind of like your grandpa saying you had to go <laughs> uphill both ways, right? But, 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 it, was, but, but it's impo it is important. 
this, you know, what we're, what we're describing to is an era that came and went, the, we, the dance and technology era. And part of the reason it existed, we were talking about this at dinner last night, was because in those times you needed to form a community to do it because everybody had to make all this stuff themselves. There was no existing tools to do any of this. And so, and so we helped each other by sharing knowledge and it came up because, well anyway, yeah, we did that. So, we made this piece, and really, it, you know, it was very simple what we did, but it, it launched, you know, what would become, as you have always said, it launched what would become Troika Ranch. We worked with a filmmaker, an actor, or, and theater director, mm -hmm. a set designer, a costume designer, Dawn and I, another choreographer, because Cal Arts was an incredible champion of, of, uh, of, of yeah, of intermedia work. Mm -hmm. And that launched the entire process of the rest of our career, right? Mm -hmm. Anything else to say about that moment? Um, not yet. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, but we didn't really start Troika Ranch together yet. It was like, you know, we were still checking it out. We started making some performances in Los Angeles in 1991. But the big moment for us came. We continued with the MIDI dancer, and I refined it, and I made now not one made of radio control car transmitters but of specialized hardware that was much smaller, much more reliable, and offered the possibility for eight sensors. And I actually will say one thing. This initial MIDI dancer, which actually was two sensors, one on the elbow, one on the knee of each dancer, was made out of a metal bar with a little metal piece of wire that had to be affixed to your skin somehow and not rip all the hair off your arm and allow you to move your arm. So there was a lot of R&D going on with us. Like, how do you attach it? We had little metal like tubes that we taped to our arms, and it was really just just this motion that it was sensing. I was talking earlier today about the limitations of sensors, but already at that moment, I started to recognize the choreography that I had to do to make that sensor activate. So all my choreography was very. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, it, and it's also brings up. I mean, you know, we talked about the reduction of this. This is like so basic; it barely measures anything, right? But it, you know, it seemed important to I me. Mean, the fact that we could pull it off felt important to us as young students. But it's also interesting about this, this kind of reduction. It's also about how you deal with it, mm -hmm. right? So in fact, a light switch on the wall is a sensor. So if I wanted to just turn the lights off and I walk over and I do that and they turn off, you don't think about it, right? But if I go to that wall sensor and I'm like, and I turn that into a performative moment where I address it and I have an interaction and a relationship to it, now that sensor somehow seems more important than it did. It's about how you work with it. You fill in a lot. Yeah, so well. You fill in for what the sensor doesn't sense. <clears throat> but that's a flaw too, and we'll come back to that. All right, let's, let's leave that and go on. So, so now we jump <clears throat> ahead five years. And this was an important moment for us because I think this was the moment, making this piece was the thing where people got to know us somehow. And this is a piece called In Plain. And maybe you you want to describe what was going on in our head a little bit with that, or do you want me to do that? Or? Uh, well, uh, my memory is that I wanted to make choreography that was hyper-physical, that was really about being as physical as I could be. Something about that was in conflict with the machines and this kind of rigidity that I was feeling from the previous MIDI dancer. Um, and we were having this uh, discussion, I guess, socially at that time about your um, doppelganger or your video or your online, which was online, was just coming online for most of us in 1994. And the, the kind of seductive nature of that creature, that video body and this light body that could do all this magic, like stop in midair and levitate or go in extreme slow motion or jump back and forth in time with an edit, which we fell in love with and used in lots of our work. Um, so there was this kind of question of competition, I think, between the power of the sweating, breathing live body and the ethereal, sexy, amazing, magic light body, video body. But even, but even leading up to that, I think, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I knew someone who had an alter ego. It was a, a male who presented online as a female, right? Mm -hmm. That was brand new in 1994, the fact mm -hmm. that you could have an alternate person that you could represent yourself in a way that maybe wasn't comfortable in your normal social circles, but was comfortable because you had an anonymous online presence. So already there's a question about who are we? What does this technology do in terms of what we're doing? I mean, that's an empowering thing. For that person, it was an empowering thing to be able to represent in that way. 
but it's also obviously we can think of situations where that can be used for ill as we know from recent history right so you know it's like that was a question that was coming up for us too I mean the difference between the this body the corporeal or and the real that you see or the and this other one or is there a difference or what are the gradations of difference between right mm -hmm. so those are the things that are running through our mind so I want to show you the beginning of this uh, piece in plain this is near the very beginning and then I want to break it down for you because some of the techniques that we were using to work with this in terms of, of sensing I think are interesting because not some of them aren't, aren't really thought about so much today. Just one small other thing about the R&D and the wearing of the thing on the body, which I was like the R&D department because I had to wear the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark uh, was able to get hold of, and maybe he'll talk about this, these flex flexion sensors that were more flexible than the just straight potentiometers we were using previously, so there was a little more flexibility in those, and we had eight of them, and he made the pack much smaller so that I could actually roll around on the floor and not break a spine. Okay, so let's try, I guess it's cinema mode. Cinema mode? Yeah. Oh. it's doing something that um, actually seemed uh, for me was quite a challenge at the time it was looking for particular postures of the body and each posture when it matched would trigger the next sound in the sequence right so it was actually doing a kind of score following this comes directly out of my work with Morton Zabotnik he was doing this kind of technique of score following looking for combinations of simultaneous events to move the score along that was one of the techniques that he used all the time and I inherited from him so in this first part the, the sounds that you're hearing are triggered by reaching those postures in fact let me just do let me just do it one more time so you can see those and then this moment is the moment where, again, putting ourselves back in 1994 is really different because Dawn knew that if she went like this, it could be a millisecond or it could be a day. But as long as she stood there and waited until she did both elbows bending and both knees bending and then both, both of them going straight again, nothing was going to happen. And that meant that as a performer, you know, because Dawn is, was, is an incredible performer. She had danced with Bella Lewitsky. She had this incredible sense of being a performer. She could feel herself. She could feel the audience, the relationship between the two, and time that moment exactly as she wished and move on to the next thing, right? And, and that's the opportunity that, you know, at the time, and I'll come back to this, we thought choreography would change forever. <laughs> we honest, honestly, I think we really truly believe that. But I don't think it happened, but we'll come back to why. But in any case, it did give her the power to make those de decisions. So now she's in this thing, and you'll see she's going to bend both elbows and both knees and straighten them, and the next thing will happen. The sound comes and the video comes. Now again, computers can't play video yet. This is grandpa moment. Um, we, inst we were using a laser disc player because it could be randomly addressed. You could tell it to go to any frame you wanted to on the laser disc, play forward or backward at multiple varying speeds. So I'm sending messages to that thing to tell it to, to play clips from this pre-recorded material that we have. And the next thing it's going to look for is for it to straighten her arms and pull them back. Can you hear the sound? But importantly, it doesn't just make that sound, it moves into part two. And the entire function of the sensor changes. And this is something that was a problem, really, because, and I think even still could be a problem, uh, although people are more familiar now, but the notion that an instrument 
could change its function from moment to moment was absolutely unfamiliar to any audience. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant is, is that without some kind of explanation, they wouldn't understand that this was live, mm -hmm. which was a really interesting problem to deal with. Now, I mean, no, we, put, on, you're doing we, we put stuff in our early programs <laughs> explaining how the technology worked, and people would come to us after pieces saying, you know, I was really watching for this, that, or the other thing to work, but I didn't see it work, and we realized they were looking at the wrong thing. They weren't looking at the piece any longer. I guess I would just say that, yeah, that, that was a really important moment of who is it most important for these uh, interactive systems. At that moment, at least, and maybe even still for me, the performer is the one who needs to know how it functions and how it plays. Whether the audience knows or not became less important to me, certainly over time. What was important is that the performer could act in their liveness as much as they could, and they performed differently. They, meaning myself, but then other dancers al along the way. You perform differently when you know that the systems are waiting for you. You're in charge. Your performance is leading them. Well, and I think uh, we stopped by, in playing, we had already stopped putting those notes in the program. Mm -hmm. We just let it be. We tried to expose the idea if we could. Yeah. Like in this, in this mo Like yeah. in this moment. But in the end, it's like a jazz performance. If you go to see a jazz piece and you actually don't understand the jazz form, those musicians playing, if they're good musicians, can still make incredible music, even if you don't know it's improvised. But if you happen to understand what jazz is and you know that it's improvised, then that adds a dimension to what you're seeing, right? So that was our idea, was that the dancers know. They're the ones who have, can take advantage of this. And if the audience is part of the picture, that's only going to enhance their interest in maybe what's going on, yeah? So um, and then in this last section, very simple, I had written an eight-part counterpoint because oh yeah by the way she was the dancer I was trained as a composer actually that's my actual training so um, all the music that we in the Troika Ranch pieces was was my composition but I'd written an eight-part counterpoint for machine sounds right so it's a percussion piece for eight pieces of eight, eight lines to, and different sounds and so I wrote that as a thing and um, it's just playing all the time it's a comp it's you know it lasts like I don't know I had a minute a half minute and a half of material right and I am an eight knobbed volume control right right yeah. <laughs> I can't sing it, but you know. But, but, but the point is, is that it was interesting because that also, I feel like, was a new concept was, um, I was, I was not, the, the composer was not the final say of what was going to happen. I handed that material to a dancer and said, now you are the final arbiter of my musical composition. Mm -hmm. She was making those decisions, and every night that she did it, a different set of rhythms and a different set of the different sounds would be emphasized depending on what part of her body she moved. But it's, we're, it's important to say that their volume thing is happening, but then she could add these accents on all eight limbs by doing a quick motion. So sl doing like this did nothing, but a sharp motion would make an extra sound that she could throw in. <laughs> using for this, by the way, you heard that, I guess. Yeah, right. So now I'll turn the lights out again. Here's later in the piece when we kind of are <laughs> letting everything rip. And, you know, and one thing that's interesting to point out, you know, not every sound that you're hearing was made by Dawn. Um, and that was a debate um, in our community. We had some kind of really intense debates about this. There were some people who, whose view was everything has to come from the performer. Otherwise, it was somehow a bit impure. Whereas my feeling was that I didn't want to be limited musically anyway by only having Dawn because in fact there was a lot of limitations in the amount of stuff she could produce and make an interesting dance piece. We'll come to that in a moment. Oh, yes. But, but um, so my idea was, you know, in Baroque music we have an ostinato, do di 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 do, and then you play on top of it, right? She's the lead. She's playing the melody, if you will, on top of the ostinato that I've provided a kind of bed of sound that can appear with her. And you'll be hearing that happening in the next section. But it's also looking at all of her movement, and that's leading to the control of the video behind her as well.
that moment, we show that moment particularly because it kind of also sums up what we were dealing with in this piece. You've got all this machine stuff, you've got this body jumping around, doing the things Don said, jumping up into the air, freezing, going in fast motion, having edits, something that the body can't do. And real Don, who by the end of this piece is drenched in sweat, because it's a super physical piece, as you can see. And, um, but in this moment, it, you have this kind of, you have a release, and suddenly that red light comes on, and you hear the sound of human breath. And, and it's that contrast between these sounds of machines, this mechanical thing, and this other side. That's what we were looking at in this particular piece. And in the end, it, it was about, it, it was a kind of like, it made, the competition is, it was kind of a competition in the end about mm -hmm. who has the most power here, which is most powerful, the, 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 the video that can move around and do these amazing things, or Dawn, who when she turns her actual sweat is going out into the audience because you see her fighting this effort to keep up with this world that's around her. It was, in fact, a competition. I also just wanted to point out, if anybody noticed a golden square show up on the video projection, um, we did that intentionally because most of the time, the video in this piece is life-size, so perhaps you could confuse it as a me, right? We're same size, same shape. Anytime I broke the frame, we put a golden rectangle on there to say, ha ha, it's not real, it's not now, it's not live, it's her. It's this other person that can do things I can't do. So we wanted to emphasize that. Um, and the end of the piece, I, also we called the piece In Plane because as sexy as she is, that video girl, she's stuck on the back wall and she can't leave. And at the end of this piece, I run and jump over the track that was also being controlled horizontally and I do this kind of, yeah, one of those. And I win, I win the game. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. The, uh, the, um, yeah. but, in, but there were several important things that came out of that, and we'll take a second to talk about that, because it started leading us into really thinking about what is it that, what in the hell are we doing with this stuff? I mean, part of it was just that we could, but now we started to really consider it, I think. And, and so one thing is that, again, with this video, you see this part, it's normally it's her body, but in that, after that moment of like the red video and you hear the sounds of breath, the light goes out and she runs where she's like tiny in the frame all the way until it's a close up. That's something you can never do as a live performer. That's only something you can do with a camera, right? Where you can go from being a tiny being to a full frame video like that. So we're, we're starting to see the, this idea, but also the fact that we were dealing with a life size creature same as Dawn on the back screen, that actually is really important and we didn't really realize it until a later piece. But. And a, ma a massive thing came out of the end of In Plane for a discussion for Mark and I that led us into a whole process for another 10 years, which was, and this might have came up yesterday a little bit, my question was, could we make a work, a dance work, that uses complex, sophisticated technology but isn't about the use of complex, sophisticated technology. And we decided to find out. Meaning, we started to invent stories, imagine narratives as I call them, human stories, that embedded in the story was always the relationship between humans and their technology, and it was neutral at times, dystopian, utopian, et cetera, but it was always embedded, but it wasn't the main story. Usually the main story was something about a human experience or a human question. But this is, the, this is one of the outcomes of this time, because this little, this little uh, chart came shortly thereafter. And I need Go to, to projection mode, though, because yeah. then we keep light on us. Sorry. He's this, not good can you all see, you see that? Yeah. yeah. Would you like to describe it, or she want me to? Oh, it's going to take both of us. Come on. Okay. <laughs> well, you start. Well, so I'm the, I'm the body, right? I'm inside the suit, and I'm coping with it and figuring out how to make something that's both interesting choreographically and interesting sonically and later visually um, with the media that I'm manipulating. And when you watch, let's say, a violin player right, play, they might inflect in their body, but you're not generally looking at their fingers on the fret for meaning about the piece. The music, the sonic experience is the meaning of the piece, right, or the whatever, the affect, maybe? I don't know. Um, but here I am wearing this instrument where I have to activate it by making certain configurations and also choreograph in a way that I think is appropriate for the piece I'm making. 
we started thinking about this. <laughs> and so I had a teacher at CalArts talk a lot about, actually too much about continuums, but these are some continuums and, and they actually, I feel like they still hold up 15, 20 years later, whatever it is. Yeah. So the first one that Don is talking about here is, is the line of physicality between dancer and musician. Uh, I have a great example for this too because, so CalArts had a deal with Yamaha, the big manufac music manufacturer, they would come around, their guys would come around and kind of like check us out and see what we were doing. And that was when I was a student. I invented the MIDI Dancer. Well, a year later, after visiting us, they patented the MIDI Dancer. They patented my device, essentially, which as a student with no money, it's not like I have a lawyer, I can't fight them, right? So it was pretty, it was pretty bummed out. But then they, about a year after that, they, it was called the Muburi suit. M-I-B-U-R-I, -I, and they brought it to Los Angeles for a demonstration. So of course, like, I wanted to go because I wanted to see. And I absolutely swear to you, there was a young uh, uh, a woman in their, their suit, which had the sensors actually built into the costume, you know, uh, very- They had more money for R&D than yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah, and this is exactly what she did. She stood there and she went, D D D D D D D D D D D D D I absolutely swear that's what she did. And but that was interesting though. Yamaha makes keyboards. They couldn't see past the fact that this was just a keyboard, that they couldn't see what it actually was, in fact. But it's a perfect example because here the choreography, there was a choreography, she moved for us but it was totally dictated by producing the right notes, right? So if she's over here, this yeah. person doing the demonstration, she is moving her body to satisfy the needs of the comp musical composition, of production of sound. Mm -hmm. And then over here, now she could have just done like whatever, and a lot of stuff would have come out, but maybe Yamaha wouldn't consider it music. I probably would have considered it music, but, but then maybe she's a dancer, but we lose some control over the sonic part of it because it can't, because the, what we're trying to point out with this diagram, you can't be both. You can end up deciding I'm gonna be a bit over here for a while, like I'm gonna move my wrist to make those breath sounds because those breath sounds are really important, but then I'm gonna slide it over here and I'm gonna start dancing on the ground and going crazy and lots of notes are gonna come out and that's fine. So thinking about this continuum, you know, that was something that we started thinking about, right? And then the other, uh, the one from top to bottom is the notion of a composed work to an improvised work. And in plane is an interesting example because in plane comes out of the kind of paradigm of score following, which is a time-based, you know, timeline. And this section is a section, then we cross into another section, we cross into another section. It was composed in time that way, but within each of those composed fragments were segments of improvisation. And so uh, I realized, though, because I performed in playing for a decade, a lot, and I got into this funky habit of just doing it the same every single time. And I was, I was struck by that. I think somebody pointed it out to me at a conference like 10 years after its birth uh, that I was still doing it how they had seen it done before. And I thought, oh, man, OK. But it's the same notion. If you're going to use interactivity, which I do this because we like to think of it as reactivity, um, why would you do D, 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 you know, why would it be fully composed? Where is the element of liveness and surprise and playability, as, you know, what we were talking about earlier? But, it, but also, again, th it's good to think of the absolute extremes of this. The composed, the, the absolute limit of composed is basically you play a CD, let's say, or play a digital file on your computer. A at the atomic level, yes, yeah, some electrons are not the same as they were the last time, but basically on the perceivable level, it's absolutely the same every time. Down here at Improvised, if I pick up this lectern, I can start playing it. Like, I can start improvising with this as a musical instrument, right? I can do that. And it actually offers me some opportunities to do that. But I, and I can kind of go, let my imagination run wild and go crazy. I mean, it's still a limitation because I've still got the object to deal with. I've got to touch it, I've got to stroke it, I've got to do something to make a sound. So it's not even, maybe it's here, <laughs> right? But I have a lot of freedom to, to touch this and improvise with it. But the other thing is, the instant that you're working with technology, you're never, ever, ever down here because somehow you made a patch in your computer, whether it's Max or whatever language you use, Isadora, you're never here. Because, because you had to create it beforehand. Mm -hmm. 
You can't make those decisions on the fly. Some decision making happened before you ever showed up at the theater. The closest we ever got was, for some unknown reason, we were invited to a, an improvisation festival in Washington, D.C. We were mystified about this. But we said yes, as we did to every piece we got, uh, invitation we got back then. So we made a deal. Don drove the car to D.C. from New York, and I started programming the patch when she talked. started driving. We're like, okay, and we talked about it. <laughs> and then we showed up at the venue and we did it. That was the closest we ever got to trying to improvise an interactive performance was that experience. <laughs> but somehow, you're going to be uh, somewhere along here, but the technology really pushes you in that direction a lot. And that's something to think about is how can we offer real improvisational choice to the performers that we are working with that are working with technology? How can you open that door, make it a little bit wider so that their choice making opportunities are bigger? I think that's something that's still a huge struggle and something interesting to think about. But it, then it leads us right to the last continuum, which is clarity obscurity, which if, some, if the instrument one is changing its function all the time and the improvisational uh, expressivity is totally free, how does anyone know what's really happening with that instrument they've never seen and playability that they've never seen? Um, so we, play, we often, in our pieces like in In Plane, we gave a sort of um, educational moment. Chicka, 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 here's how it works. Chaka, 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 here's how it works. Chicka, chaka, chaka. So that we could then leave that limitation of needing to be clear about it and go to a more artistic expressivity for ourselves, hopefully bringing people along. But yeah, that's exactly right. And just to say, but when we're talking about clarity and obscurity, we're talking about clarity and obscurity of the instrument, of, mm -hmm. of what's happening in terms of the interactive system, yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's really a 3D sphere of like all of these yeah. continuums, and I think that you can make decisions and slide around on it. I mean, again, this was a debate in our community. Like some people were very fixed on the idea that you know this notion of like changing the, the meaning of the instrument, uh, you know, was was really not really was really problematic, and that you know we always had to let the dancer champion, and we could never let the musician side champion. You know, it's it, these kinds of these were very personal choices in a way. So. This also came into our pedagogy, though, when we started teaching workshops together in 1999, and we taught them for 16 years all over the place, and this was a, a useful tool of describing the experience of interactivity and sensitivity. So, so okay, so that's 1994, and we do that piece, we, start, we get to perform it a lot. We first did it at the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, and then we got a lot of chances, and that's when people kind of knew about us, and we started getting lots of invitations to teach. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, because there were not so many people in, in the States anyway that knew about this kind of stuff, could talk to students about it, show them how to do it. And so we were getting a lot of invitations. At the same time, we continued to make work. We're, there's a piece we made that I'm not going to show here um, tonight, today. There's too many to show all yeah. one day. But it's called the, uh, the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. It was based on a text of the same name from 1600s about alchemists that was a kind of coded uh, message of, about alchemy. Um, but it was almost, it was like, who, I don't know, I didn't know if they have LSD in 1600s, but this guy took it who wrote the book, because it's really <laughs> astonishing imagery. But it was in that piece, too, that, because uh, it's two years after this that we visit the Studio for Electro-Instrumental Music in Amsterdam, or Stein, and it's 1996, and Steina Visoka, the a partner of Woody Visoka, is the leader there that year, and she has started a whole program, and they've made a software called Imagine. Very important software that not very many people know. It's I M Image slash I N E. Yeah, with sla there's a slash. slash. At, yeah, and you see the slash artists, mm -hmm. they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, created by a really beautiful guy and wonderful programmer called Tom DeMeyer. And it was the first software I know of that ran on a personal computer that allowed you to interactively manipulate video imagery. So it, it's the first one. I mean, maybe there's something else I don't know about, but it's the first I know. And we saw that and we're like, oh my God, and we were there in residency. We didn't even know, we didn't know going there it existed. We immediately had the mini dancer hooked up to it and we were manipulating it. And we used that software um, for the chemical wedding piece. But it had a lot of different limitations that I didn't love. It had this table-based interface I really didn't like. And there was a kind of crucial moment. I was in that piece. Can, yeah. Can I just, I want to be the one to tell this. Please because. Do. So it's 1996, so for some, some years now, I'm the one on stage with the systems, and the computer crashes sometimes in the 90s. It crashes. 
And the rule was, the show will go on. I will carry on, and Mark will catch up somehow. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna announce to the people, oh, we have to stop it. I just kept on going and improvising if I needed to, and then the Mark would catch up, and we'd carry on, and hopefully no one noticed. Then, in, in The Chemical Wedding, when we performed it in 1998-9, Mark was in that piece as a kind of actor character. And it was the first time that the computer crashed on Mark. And he was like, and there was a and there was a blue uh, screen and the Mac reboot sound as yep. I'm standing there. It was a hard crash, and so that was a Mark's moment of like, this can't happen. And I was like, I've been saying this. Yeah, well, it was it was, it was more like more like fuck this shit. I'm gonna write my own software. It was more like what happened. So, but that actually was really important. But but seeing Imagine and using it. That was super influential because suddenly a new media was added to the toolbox. We had the possibility of not only controlling sound, but of controlling imagery. And that opened a whole new door. And it really, we did use it in that piece, but it, it just, it also, it was really, the table-based interface was really inflexible. And I wanted something that fit under my fingers a little bit better. So, are we going to jump to 16 reps? Because we are way running out of time. Yeah, well, we, we're, it's, we're at 45 minutes. I think. Mm -hmm. What we should we're do is. We're finishing at quarter after. Huh? We're stopping at quarter after. Yeah, I know. Or three o'clock, so we can hour. have questions. Think, yeah, okay. Let's. It's let's. Too much. We'll, we'll, you want to skip the. I skip think the we editing just. Part. We just have to go to 16 revolutions and yeah, sort of. Okay. So but, we're going to skip but, like 10 but years. Let me, the reason I. I we're, what I normally would do here, if I was not having a workshop with you in a little while, I would talk a little bit about how Isadora came into being and why the choices were made this about. Is fascinating. Yes. Yeah. Well, but I think I think we can sort of say it as I'm teaching you the beginnings of Isadora during the workshop. I don't think I have to do it right now. Sure. But suffice to say, I think the I think the important part I will say right now is that, um, again, because we were getting we were getting invited everywhere, and then I eventually I, I started making this tool. It wasn't for another um, three years that I started selling it, uh, thinking that you know I could sell like a few. I, I really didn't know it would turn into what it turned into. But what happened was, every time we would go teach a workshop, we would give it to the dancers there. That were, usually they were dancers, and usually, especially in those days, they were incredibly unfamiliar with technology. And so what I did in every workshop with Don working with me, both of us, we'd watch them fail. They, we'd see, they'd be like, I don't understand that. You know. And I would literally go home, recode that part of the program, and show up with a floppy disk, yes, a floppy disk, the next day, and we'd put a new version on their computer. So together, we were observing where they got lost, reacting to that really in situ, and providing new versions. So there was this kind of incredible two and a half year long beta test thing, where we were interacting with these young, usually young, performers and dancers, who are working with this material. But that's why Isadora turned out the way it did. That's why it wasn't Max. Mm -hmm. Max was designed for a different, for, I'm using Max as an example, as something where there's a little box and it's a, it's, if you're not really into it, like you look at that and you're like, I have no idea what that means. Some of the simple things in Isadora that made a big difference, and I don't know why I chose to do them necessarily, was you see the numbers, you see the actual values, you see the titles of the parameters, you have an icon for every actor to let you know what that thing does or give you a guess about it. Those are very comforting for beginners. And the other thing about being a beginner with it is that in this first workshop that we taught in 1999, we had to rent laptops for the dancers who came to that workshop. They didn't have computers. They didn't touch computers. They didn't know what the trash was or how to save files, none of that. And the software that Mark kind of hacked together to do that workshop was so, the learning curve was so intense that we didn't get to really the creative part of playing with this tool. Another motivation for Isadora. And why those numbers and things are visible is so that you know something's happening, something at all is happening. And also, when you first touch Isadora, you hook this box to this box, generally, something happens. It might not be the something that you want. You get there 5, 10, 15 years later. But something happens. So there's immediate feedback. Do you want me to Stop over on fifth, uh, future memory for a second, or should I just skip it? Oh sure, I don't know. All right, okay. <laughs> just, just briefly. And we just wanted to make sure and have room for questions yeah. too. So but just briefly. Okay. <laughs> Speed and intensity of the visual effects. Oh my goodness! I just like I just made a complete mess of everything. Hold on one second. <laughs>
Say something incredibly interesting, Dawn, while I fix that. Well, <laughs> I was going to have us jump uh, to 2006 because, okay, here's an interesting thing I'll say. Back then, and I even feel it now, there was a lot of energy around going to the next new thing. And the MIDI dancer was built from like, you know, hack, uh, Mattel Power Glove, remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was like that, that was the paradigm of that moment. Everybody was hacking these and putting them all over the bodies. And we really early, <laughs> we said how, it, we thought of this as building an instrument, right? We built an, a new instrument, I just learned how to play it. How could we play it well if we gave up on it after the first piece and went to the next new thing? We need to spend 10 years with this. And we committed, like shook hands, like we're doing 10 years with the MIDI dancer. And we did that. And we did all kinds of things with it. And then some new paradigms came into existence in 2004, 5, 6, which well, we'll let's, get to let's in a show second. the la let's show. And it wasn't the last MIDI dancer piece, but it's it's useful because of one element that I really want to point out. So this is called Future of Memory. This is the piece that we want a Bessie for in New York. And and um, uh, there's one element though that was super important. This is also a very interesting oh, solo also with Don. The... Oh, not this one. <laughs> designer we said this piece has to do with passing through spaces and he brought up the idea of windows and doors which we like and he, we set him off to make this design and you see these panels behind Dawn here and it just so happened that they were six feet high and about this wide in other words they were the size of a human being and what that meant was in this piece we could either have a full frame image with obviously with the gaps between the different panels, but we could also have an image that was the same size as Dawn, a lot like in plane, right? Because the problem, which I'm sure as a, as a pedagogue, many of you have experienced, is that the first thing that, you know, uh, or often the first thing that happens as soon as people get the opportunity to work, um, to work with uh, video and dance, they put a gigantic interesting image behind the dancer and nobody looks at the dancer anymore. It's the first mistake that we all have to make, right? But here, we had a whole bunch of surfaces that were human sized, basically. And that meant the idea of a duet, which we all know for, for making choreography, was really easy to manage because you had things that were of similar size. And you could play with this thing is doing something and then this thing is doing something in a much easier way. So his choice, I mean, he decided, he didn't tell us he was going to make these objects this size. But that actually, we use that a lot in that, that piece, using individual panels to show the dancers. And that was something that was, became really important for, for later stuff. But I, I just think that that point, too, about uh, we've been, we always try and work in our workshops, especially when we have longer ones and some materials, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll get to this in this time. But you have to think in 3D. Do not think about putting an image on the back wall. You have an entire space with depth. There's all kinds of opportunity to put that image forward and backward and above and below. It's like having students play with those possibilities and to, ex to see what they can really do with it opens a lot of doors in terms of the relationships you can create on stage. And I'll just say pedagogically something that I, that has come out of Mark and I teaching workshops together and our own interest in sort of drawing video off the back wall and bringing it into the space somehow, um, is that I, I created a thing I call the V5, which is basically the five ways I've ever seen video used in a live performance ever. Again, there's a <laughs> series of continuums. Uh, the first one is as character. In plane is a great example of that. There's a her in there and a her out here and we are in relationship. Or it could be an anthropomorphized entity that's not a face or a person, but feels like a presence, a character. The second one is as environment, where you're giving a place for the performers to perform that is not literally in the theater. You're creating, it's a set, it's a set design, right? The third one is as cinema, which in this piece, we, there's a recurring piece of video that happens that actually evolves over the course of the piece by adding uh, material that you saw from the piece live a few minutes ago now recurs in this recurring uh, video segment. That third one is called Video as Cinema, where the dancers are not important, the performers are not important, 
watch the movie. The fourth one is as light, where you actually use the projector as a light source. This is very common these days. Uh, the next piece that we'll show, I think uh, ex we explore that really fully for ourselves. And the fifth way is video as score, which is what I was talking about a little bit in Curie's lecture and, and symposium this, after this morning about using digital materials as choreographic generative methods. And we'll talk about that with Loop Diver. Yeah. Moving on. Um, so, so jump forward into how, how, yeah, how do you want to jump it into I think we need to just leap forward to 16 revolutions and the onslaught of infrared camera tracking. Yeah, it was okay. a moment. It was a real moment. We learned about, about this process from Golan Levin and Zach Lieberman, who had done a piece called Mesa de Voce with Joan LaBarbera and Yip. I yep, think yep. Yip. He's a, yeah, I forget he's his last a name. Dutch. Uh, extended vocal technique singer, uh, and the beauty of using infrared light and uh, camera tracking systems was that you could now, for the first time, project and track in the same space. Because as maybe you know, um, when you're tracking, you have to distinguish between the thing you're tracking and the background. And with it, using an infrared light system, well, you no longer have if to you're, If you're, system. just to explain that a little bit, because yeah. it's really, it's actually, Mesa de Voce, if you don't know it, find oh, it, because okay. it's a seminal moment. Again, I never know if anything's the first, but it's the first I know of where people were using interactive, I mean, uh, 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 infrared. infrared light to allow projections to appear on the performers as they were performing. That was just something I had never seen before. And then right after that was apparitions, which yeah. passed over my <laughs> Right. And so it, it, then it explodes, and it starts to be everywhere, and now it's very common. But, but um, so that's an important piece. But the thing is, is that when you... Um, the thing that was lucky, or the thing that made this work, because of course, if you're tracking me and I have light on me, well, if you like, let's say you just point a theater light at me or you turn one up, it ruins the tracking because maybe my light level changes. This is a technical problem, right? But if you shine infrared light on the back wall and I'm downstage of that and you point an infrared camera at me, it sees a big white wall and a black mark a silhouette in front of that wall, and now I can track it because luckily, projectors produce no infrared light. Yeah. That's, the, that's the key to it. So, um, I mean, but I'll just let you, just, just I'll, this is a, a, a little explanatory clip that I think will yeah. give the whole picture just so that you can see it. Real-time motion tracking allows the dancers to interactively manipulate the digital media as they perform 16 revolutions. The motion tracking features of EyesWeb are combined with the analysis and image generation capabilities of Isadora, the real-time media manipulation software designed by artistic director Mark Coniglio. The stage environment consists of a cyclorama filled with infrared light and a single infrared camera located downstage. As the dancers move in front of the cyclorama, the camera sees a black silhouette. EyesWeb analyzes this image generating a 12-point skeleton that tracks the movement of their torso and limbs. The position and trajectory of each point is sent from EyesWeb to Isadora over a local area network. There, the path of each point is analyzed using the gesture module, measuring the straightness, curvature, complexity, path length, velocity, and other parameters. These measurements are then used to generate the visuals and to manipulate aspects of the sonic score. Black and white graphics from motion tracking. Does that look familiar to anyone? Yeah, yeah. It's all over now. <laughs> Our research has focused on sensing the quality of a gesture, meaning we wanted to quantify parameters that relate closely to the viewer's experience of a gesture. When analyzing a single path, some parameters are easily quantifiable, like velocity or acceleration. Others with subjective labels like simple, complex, jittery, angular are less obvious. A special Isadora module called Gesture was created to break the path of each point tracked by EyesWeb into meaningful units, represented here by different colors, and to perform an analysis on these paths. By carefully linking these measurements to the visual and oral score, a rich network of interactive control was offered to the performers. Okay, so there you go. That's that. And um, so that was our entry to that. But it's also significant around this time, like 
everyone who was at the forefront of this field stopped using video imagery. It yeah. all became graphics. I don't know, it was just like a thing that happened. I think it's just because it became possible. Perhaps. Infrared but, tracking was a thing, and then particle systems. But it started with Mesa de Voce. They, yeah, they, no, that's because true. they had no video. It yeah, was yeah. all imagery, like that's graphic true. imagery, like that. So that's, that's sort of a significant change in the field. But I made that uh, thing about the particle system you saw just now, because that's what, mostly what we see with interactive dance today is stuff that looks like that one way or the other. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that that's like the remnant of this that we see the most. So. It's now 3 o'clock. Huh? 15 minutes. Yeah, I know. We're, we're, we're Ish. okay. Um, <laughs> 10. So, because I could. Yeah, I think uh, we should just go into loop dive though, because I think that's the yeah. place we want to get to. I think, so by now what? It's oh wait, the, one oh. thing about 16 revolutions, because we also showed that piece, which you didn't see any of the actual piece, around a lot. Um, and it was at that moment that we were coined by somebody else who was writing something about us as content-driven artists rather than materials-driven artists. Which means we turned off the interactivity sometimes. In 16 Revolutions, there's a 12 minute section of two almost naked dancers in complete, like, distraught states in a theatrical moment where there is no interactivity. No, no, no visuals, no, none of that. It's, it's a theater moment. And it's long in this piece. And we thought that was fine because the piece we were making was about this kind of distinction between our emotional, our animal selves and our intellectual selves. And this was how we needed to express that idea in this moment. And then we go back into some graphic imagery and but, some interaction. But it's worth talking about that for a second because everything that we did with technology was because we had an idea and we wanted to use it to serve that idea. So let's talk about 16 Revolutions in this regard. I feel like I should show something. but. Can you show it at the background and talk? That's like <coughs> impossible to yes. see. Yes, no, I can do that actually. Um, just have to turn the volume down a little bit. So I'm just going to, this is just like the excerpts tape, tape and I'll just talk over it. Um, so, so the basic idea though, the basic, keep going. Uh, the basic theme as Don said was, who are we as animals and who are we as human beings. What is the distinction between that? You know, I mean, an animal, you know, basically is worried about reproducing and eating. Three that's, Fs. Yeah. Feeding, fucking, fighting. Right. That's it. And, and that's where they're at. But human beings get lost in what we all get lost in. This moment that Don was talking about, this 12-minute moment. One morning I was eating breakfast, I was having cereal, and I realized I came out of like some trance, and I realized I hadn't thought about anything for like a minute or two. I was lost and I was just not there. Animals are always present because there always could be a threat that will kill them. We can be actually not present. That to me is one, just one of the many distinctions we were thinking about. And that moment at the table she's talking about is that moment for me, that moment that I was eating breakfast. So, but everything that we were doing was how, because the technology came to represent us as human beings, us as intellectuals because it is the extension of our intellect, the stuff that we have made. And we were trying to put that on stage in such a way that you could see those representations. And I think after I this is one good example. Of the line. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about that. Anyway, but because the other side of it was we were representing, like there's one, like, again, this part here, there's no media or interaction. They're just relating to each other. But there is a technology, two of them. There's a shoe and a table. Right. Well, we, we were considering technology in a very broad sense. And um, there was also the first time we worked with a dramaturg later on. And he helped us, and I thought it was uh, important to mention just because of yesterday, he helped us create a kind of arc for the way the visuals presented themselves in the piece, that it had its own dramaturgical arc. Yeah. Because now we'll come to the part that I was talking about. Because here, like, you've only seen single straight lines up until this point, and now in this section we have this first particle system, which you saw a moment ago, and in a moment, right now it's still single straight lines, but then there's, it becomes like horizontal as well, and it almost looks, it starts to, it's, to us it suggested a cityscape. It almost looks like buildings, it looks like architecture. This and, the, and the way in which this movement is being choreographed is also done from this intellectual perspective, right? This is also us breaking the system, because Eyes Web only put, puts one skeleton on whoever it sees, 
but Mark and I both went in front of the camera, and it put one skeleton between us. What? The left hand and the left foot, and then the, the right hand and the and right foot And the head foot was, was somewhere here. in the middle. And so we used that. We just was like, that's great. Let's have the, like, the sort of clump of dancers moving around manipulate these images, even though it's not uh, exactly point to point. Well, it's kind of hard, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to get into these pieces, because really to analyze this piece and show you everything that we were thinking about, we have to watch the whole piece, and we don't have time. But the point is, is that, and this is what we always emphasize, I'm sure you emphasize this to your students too, you do not put something on stage because it's cool. Because no. you know what? Cool is, is last in a public's memory for about 15 seconds, and after that they have forgotten it. You put it on stage because it supports something that you think is great or that you're pissed off about, one of the two. That's why we put things on stage, and that involves the lighting, the costumes, the set, the technology, everything. Right? And that's the thing that we emphasize over and over again that, you know, uh, uh, and we'll close, we'll go to a, a loop dive after this. That Cal Arts in 1971, before we went there, there was a very strict rule in the visual art department. The rule was no technique before need. This was in the painting department. It, the idea was they didn't want to produce copies of the teachers. They wanted to have individual, strong, artistic voices. So no teacher could offer a technique to a student only if the student asked, how do I, could they answer the question. That was the rule. And we learned about that. We, it didn't really exist in the same way when we were there. But we have a rule book, an imaginary Troika Ranch rule book. Rule number one is never buy plane tickets before you've got a contract with someone. That was learned the hard way. <laughs> um, but rule number 17 or 18 is no technology before need. That's a, that's a really strong and important rule to pass on, I think, to young people and students especially. So anyway, and then, you know, because, and this, by this point, by the way, suddenly curved lines has appeared because for the first time, someone does something of their own volition. They leave this kind of state of being lost and really act after being at that table for 12 minutes. And something changes, and you see color, and you see curved lines for the first time. So <coughs> the graphics are supporting the dramaturgy of the story of this piece, right? OK. It goes on. <coughs> so. <coughs> so. After, right at this moment, are we going to Loop Diver? Yes. Wow, are we talking diver. fast now or what? <laughs> uh, uh, right at this moment, I think, if my memory serves, Mark and I were getting a little underwhelmed with what was happen happening visually in these kinds of works. It all kind of looked beautiful and seductive and particles flying everywhere and, you know, 3D models and stuff. And we were wondering about the disturbing. That was one thing that was going on. The other thing I know for me is I turned 40 in 2006, and I had this, and we'd been teaching workshops, and if anybody has ever downloaded the demo of Isadora, it comes with some example files, and one of those files is of me in In Plane from 1993, that video, and I've been looking at that video looped in all kinds of different ways in workshops for 10 years at that point, or more than that, 10. Um, so this notion of repetition and looping was kind of on our mind. Want to add something yeah, to well, and so we just had, the, all we said was, we're going to make a dance about looping. And we had done some other stuff before. I skipped over it, but I'll just flash it on the screen for you to let you see. Like, yeah, so there's like this little thing that we just did as an experiment, really. So it's the same, same phrase shot in eight different locations, but then you see the same bit of that location eight times. So you see what we, what we were, this was from 2001, and what we were already interested in was error, which that came up earlier today too. Error, and, and uh, that notion gets kind of exploited, the notion of error in, in Loop Diver. So, so we said we're going to make this piece about looping. We, we started off by making a study. I'll just flash that on the screen briefly, too. And we thought, we're making dance moves. We put it into the computer. We do some looping on it. But she's going to learn it. But we're still putting the actual result of that loop video behind her. You see, and you see her syncing up with that, At right? Times. Yeah. More often than not, she's in a state of error. Yeah. That's important to notice. Partly because, as we all know, an edit is impossible. I can't go from here to here in zero time with no transitional movement. It can't happen. So we're, we're simulating. Right. But, but the, the important the shift I'm about to describe was we were thinking in a, a, the kinds of movements one would generally call dance as a way of working. But after doing a lot of research and skipping a lot of steps in terms of that research, what we figured out was what was really more interesting to watch 
with extremely uh, pedestrian actions, walking forward, shaking hands, embracing someone, sidestepping like this. And it was partly because, come here for a second. Yeah. If I, if Mark, if the action we're gonna do, if the action I'm gonna do is this, it could be that or it could be that, right? Sorry. Yeah. But on the way, in the looping, you don't know what it's gonna be until it gets there. And even the act of getting there doesn't reveal its intention fully because of this weird breaking up of time. So, so, more so, I made, so I made a special tool in Isadora to do this looping. And it um, allowed, because normally the loop that we all know, it's the same piece of material and you loop it over and over and over again. In this tool, the starting point and the ending point of the loop could be changed as the looping progressed. And I'll let you to see that so that. you can understand what I'm talking about. And we came up with a name. These are the atomic looping units. That's our little name for it. There are 16 variations of this. I'm going to show you a couple. But let's start with, this is just a small piece of material. They stand up, basically. They shift apart and they turn. Here's the loop that we all know, the one where it's the same bit each time. And it's moving forward and it jumps back. The other variation is a palindrome loop where it goes forward and backwards, but it's still the same piece of material. That's the one that a human dancer can almost do, right? The other one with the edit, they can't actually do. That's impossible. They can try, but it's not possible. But now, this one, I want to describe it before it happens. Here is the chunk of video. That's time going this way. And so if you play this, and after it completes this bit, it's going to shift both loop points a little bit later. And then it plays it, and it shifts them a little bit later. And so that looks like this. The next one is going to be the, the starting point is going to be fixed and the ending point is going to get later in time. We call this a growing loop. Here's one where it's shifting, it says growing, but it's wrong, it's getting shorter. So it's shifting later in time, but the end point is moving this way, so they're moving towards the same piece of material. Okay, those are just some of the possibilities. So we have this tool, and in the end, again, I'm, I'm really skipping so many sets. We, we got a, it was the most money we ever got for a piece. Yeah, we, had two, piece. we took yeah. two years making this and made three kind of versions of the piece until with the third one being the final one. But in the end, what we came to was we decided we made a five-minute dawn, choreographed a five-minute long dance of this in, with very pedestrian material. To a piece of music that you had written. I wrote a five-piece long... So those yeah. were linked. I forgot. Did I do it yes. first? No. Probably not, because okay. I always made the movement yeah, first. Okay. But the, what I mean is the dance and the movement were made to go together. So, and and, it was five and then we, long. using six cameras around the room, we recorded that. Mm -hmm. We then took that material, Don and I, and we sat in front of a computer and we started doing this, this composition process by looping it. So we had the five minutes. It was now set, it was recorded. All we could do was change the looping, yeah. which is a slight lie because actually her part was totally fixed. As a composer, I could go in and change my file and move a note by a tenth of a second. Mine was done. It was recorded. It was done. We, right. There was no change in it. Well, because also, we're doing this while we're starting to teach the dancers. Anyway, so we can't go back, basically. But I actually had a little bit of leeway, I must admit. But the interesting tension was, Dawn would be like, she'd loop it, so she liked it, and I hated the way it mu sounded musically. And then we'd have to have a struggle or he'd about loop this. Or that sounded great, and I'd be like, oh my god, wait, we can't do that. Yeah. So there was this really, because it was the only piece, we always work really closely together, but it was the only piece where both composer and dancer had to be present for every second of the composition together. There was no way out of it because it had to be made together. So that was really interesting for us and, and difficult too because we had to, you know, to navigate like, when am I going to give in to make her thing look better and when, you know, when that, how is that going to happen? In the end, that five minutes through the repetition became 45 minutes long because there's a little bit of unlooped material at the end of the piece that's, uh, that's a kind of epilogue. But basically there's 45 minutes of material and there's 4,000 edits in that video. We 
we exported that final result and that video was never seen by the public. That was given to our dancers and we said, learn this and do it exactly like you see it. And that process was excruciating. I will tell you, it was fascinating, but it was excruciating. Actually, people quit. Yeah, some of the dancers quit. <laughs> the guys. Because it actually had a cycle. <laughs> the guys quit. <laughs> it it mm -hmm. had a psychological effect on them. They reported to us that they were getting depressed. Yeah, it was horrible. That they were actually having a psychological result. Because think about it, you know, I always mention when we talk about Loop Diver that during that time, part of it was made in New York. One day we had a day off. I went to Central Park just to hang out and relax. There was a guy, a homeless guy on a bench, and I observed him from a distance. And he was sitting on the bench, ragged clothes, dirty, and he was just doing this. And it went on for, I watched for at least 15 minutes. This is someone who had a trauma so severe, the only way he could cope was by repeatedly doing that movement. I'm just sure of it. That, I, I mean, I can't be really sure, but I believe that's what the story is. And lots of people, and I think that this kind of repetitive motion is one way to deal with the traumatic, stressful event which helped us discover what the actual story behind this piece was. So this, so this process was because it was so fascinating because every dancer had a different method to try and memorize and learn those 4,000 edits. Somebody, one of them had a notebook. Another one just watched the video over and over and over again. Another one had a set of like bizarre icons that they looked at. So we had actually completely changed not only we changed the compositional process, but now the rehearsal process was totally different somehow, right? There was also, because you're in a constant state of failure, because you can't actually edit in real time, and because it's very hard to know what point zero zero one of a second time movement is exactly, we had to make some rules for how we were going to be a unified group performing together. Um, the notion was that you try to be right. You try to do the right loop. Because also, you know, sometimes we're palindrome, we're going forward, we're going backward. And then you get off, you're like, wait, am I going forward or am I going backward? Wait, where? And you, like, you get lost in the process. Uh, Mark gave us some sonic cues to help us know. We had two terminologies, the loop step and yeah. the loop. Well, let's just look at it okay. and then we can, we can show There was that. a lot so that came out of it in terms of um, vocabulary and how to work this physical system amongst us as the performers. So here is the first 25 seconds of the five minute recording that we talked about with the music that I put with it. So they stand up. understanding that this was somehow a piece that dealt with trauma of some kind because that's what it really became for us um, by this point before we made that five minutes we knew it because that moment is they're standing up you know the moment in a movie when someone has had a terrible experience and they go in the bathroom to wash their face and they look in the mirror and you see them looking in the mirror that's a that's a kind of icon or a, a trope oh, right, let's say right, yeah. that's that moment now, you won't know that when you see it looped in a second. You, won't, you would never have recognized it. But that's what we told them. Is they, we told them that they had to invent their own trauma. They had their own story about it. We didn't want to know. But that, that's what they were doing. This whole five minutes was about them coping with this imaginary trauma that the, each of the six dancers had invented for themselves. So here's the looped version of that same material. This is what Don was talking about. This is the loop number, and this is the loop step. The loop number changes when the kind of loop changes. This is a shifting loop later, the each, like this. The but same. the duration is staying the same. That's why the D is There's there. There's like 27 of them, I think. Yep. So I'll zoom in on the middle part so you can see. That was just three of the six cameras you could see there. This video was never seen by the audience. This was only a score for the dancers to follow. But I wanted to get at least to the next loop step loop uh, here, which will come in just a moment. Loop, loop 
number two, the, the starting point is staying the same. The duration is decreasing, so the rhythm is going to speed up. And what we discovered too, walking was the worst thing that they had to deal with. Walking was the worst, right? Like here. Like how do you do that as a physical performer? And now we're in loop three, and it's shifting later. Now, I mean, again, think about replicating this movement. Anyway, I'd love to show you more, but we have to keep moving. So that's what it looked like on the on the score. Here's what it actually. Here's what it looked like when they did that same part. So the music and the. DMX lighting information and the video that's in the screen, which is not the video we recorded, it's a different video, that's all digitally looped. And then the dancers it's, are. It's looped in the exact same way that the choreography was looped. Right. section but sensors and in behind or around is a result that's coming from that. It's kind of like a funhouse mirror. It might be all wavy and you can't really 
you know, exactly see the original image, but you still know that the image in front of you in the funhouse mirror is a body, it's you, right? That relationship is how most people were working. In this piece, really by accident, we didn't set out, because I tried over and over again to put interactivity in this, because that's what Troika Ranch does. We have interactivity, and this, it did not belong in this piece. Every time I tried, it ruined what we were doing. It ruined it. Instead, we adopted something else, which, I'm, which I call the digital intervention. The idea is, we adopted a technology called looping. The most core technology for any computing system is the fact that it will repeat something a billion times and never complain. It's so happy to repeat that over and over and over again. It's part of the nature of computing. We took something that is so essential to that world and we put it on a human body and said you be like a machine now what does that do to you and what story does that tell and in doing that all of the things that Don alluded to already the fact that you can't get from here to here the fact that you know we were talking about you had to run back when those giant loops happen it wasn't possible so we turn the light up it's like the golden rectangle look they're running back to where they belong we're not going to deny that it's happening bring attention to it right because later what we did to the dancers that was their challenge those spaces to recover got less and less and less as the 45 minutes went along so that it became even more intense for them to try and live up to our instruction so that intervention, and it's not a new idea. Arnold Schoenberg did it with the 12-tone system. Um, uh, what's the thing with uh, Trisha Brown? Locus. Locus, right? <laughs> 26 letters in the thing. The idea of this intervention isn't a new idea. It's been done plenty of times before in the art world. But I think what we did with Loop Diver, and what I, myself I know, and Dawn too, have continued to do in the work since then is take an idea from the world of technology and use it to intervene in the way we create, rehearse, or perform work. Because the main thing was, I told you that we thought in 1989, a new kind of choreography would emerge from this interactive work. If you look at it, it absolutely didn't. Okay, like Merce Cunningham, biped, New York Times calls it a masterpiece, and it's and excellent, it's I love that piece. Did it look any different than any Merce Cunningham choreography that ever came before? No, it looked exactly the same, it hadn't changed at all. Nothing bad about that, because it was great, it's a great piece. But it didn't change the way we were choreographing. And one thing that might be interesting for you to look at, look at 16 Revolutions three years before, and then look at Loop Diver. You will see that an entirely new choreography that we had never done before came out of adopting that system. That's what was powerful for us, was that it led us into directions we just never thought we would go in. And that's something that I still, to this day, I have a very strong feeling about using technologies as interventions, as opposed to uh, inter, you know, a reflection idea. So that's my last, my last bit. I don't know if you want to say the last thing. I, I think we're out of time. I think probably. I'm not going to summarize. If you want me to answer a question, I'd be happy to. Maybe you want to stand up and shake your butts. <laughs> 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 yeah. Not, not a question, a, a small request. A, a really lovely phrase right at the end. It started, I believe, we talked about the idea from technology. Yeah. 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 Yeah.